Welcome to To Kill a Mockingbird. You're in for a real treat. Uh, this book by Harper Lee was published in 1960. One year later, it won the Pulitzer Prize. In 1962, it was made into a hit a Hollywood movie starring Gregory Peck, won the Academy Award. The book went on to be one of the best-selling books in history. It's uh, sold tens of millions of copies, been translated into dozens of languages. Uh, a group, a library group, a few years ago listed what they thought to be the most important books of the 20th century. This was listed as the number one most important novel of the 20th century. And in 2018, the great writer Aaron Sorkin adapted it for a play. The plot of this play is on one level simple, on another level very complicated. The simple level, it's about racism. But it's also a coming of age story for a young girl named Scout, who's the protagonist and sort of the storyteller uh, in, this, in this affair. It takes place in a fictitious town in Alabama around the time of the Great Depression. So this is late 20s, early 1930s. And uh, the town is overrun with racism. There's a white racist named Bob Ewell, the guy that lives on the other side of the tracks. He's a troublemaker. Everybody steers clear of him. And it turns out his daughter is beaten and potentially raped. Bob Ewell accuses Tom Robinson, who's a young 25-year-old African-American man. So that's the case. Uh, Robinson is arrested, goes to jail, and the town's lawyer, Atticus Finch, decides to take the case. So the plot that you're about to see is Atticus trying to prove that Tom Robinson is innocent, which he is, and Bob Uhl was guilty, uh, which he was. The title, To Kill a Mockingbird, comes from words from Atticus Finch, the lawyer. At one point, he tells his daughter that you can't really judge things as they are, and you must always be kind and always do the right thing. For example, why would somebody kill a mockingbird, which is Florida State bird? Um, because it's a beautiful and innocent creature. And that theme plays out throughout it. Tom Robinson is a kind, church-going, innocent, good person who is up, you know, on trial. There are other themes that tie into this plot, and that is things aren't always what they seem. What you'll see in the play is there's an eccentric guy that the kids in the play name Boo, and they think he's kind of a boogeyman, and everybody dares one another to run up to his house, touch the door of the house. There's all kinds of urban lures and legends about all the horrible things that occur in his house. Turns out he's a very nice guy. Turns out that he saves the kids' lives. So there are many things in the book and the play and the book that aren't as they seem, but as we go through, we see it uh, by the end of the play. So the play that you're about to see is set during the Great Depression, late 20s, uh, early 1930s. And that time in America was a particularly difficult time. We've all heard of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. It was formed right after the Civil War ended, 1865, in Pulaski, Tennessee. However, through President Ulysses Grant's presidency in the late 1860s, early uh, throughout the 1870s, the KKK basically ended as an organization. But before the Great Depression, 1920s, 30s, the KKK rose to some of the highest numbers in the history of the country. So this is on the coattails of the resurgence of the KKK. Some of America's most celebrated individuals were brutal racists and anti-Semites. Henry Ford, probably the wealthiest American, a hero to many. Henry Ford was a bitter racist and anti-Semite. Henry Ford bought a newspaper in Dearborn, Michigan and devoted over 90 issues of the paper to just spewing racist and anti-Semitic nonsense. Henry Ford spent his own fortune, and he was notoriously frugal, a guy that had holes in the bottom of his shoes, to get a book uh, called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is this book of the worst conspiracy theories throughout history, which we're familiar with some of them today. And he printed it in English. When you bought one of his cars, there was a copy of the book there. So this is on the heels of Henry Ford. Ford. It's on the heels of Charles Lindbergh, America's hero, Lucky Lindbergh, first person to cross solo the Atlantic Ocean on the spirit of St. Louis, which is the town where this plate takes place. Lindbergh was a brutal anti-Semite and a bitter racist. Lindbergh was a hero of Adolf Hitler, and Lindbergh did not downplay that connection. It also comes on the heels of other famous Americans like Father Charles Coughlin. 
He was a radio priest from the Midwest who had tens of millions of listeners through the 20s and 30s. That's an audience anybody would give a lung for today. Yet Father Charles Coughlin organized these America First, these Make America Great groups around the country, which were armed vigilante groups to attack Jews, African Americans, immigrants, and others. Uh, so this is what's happening around the country as the play is, uh, is, is appearing. So the court trial is sort of the highlight of this play. And in some ways, it's surprising. In other ways, for someone like myself and the story, it's not at all surprising. Because there were thousands of court cases uh, where innocent African Americans and others were found guilty. We need to remember there were two important court cases that sort of provide a conceptual basis for the case in this play. One was uh, Dred Scott. This is 1857. Dred Scott was a slave, was black. Uh, Dred Scott was born in Virginia. Uh, his slave owner took him to Alabama, St. Louis. Along the way, he was sold to an army surgeon. The surgeon then took Dred Scott to Illinois, which was a free state in the north, and Wisconsin, which was a territory at the time, but also free. Then took him back into the deep south. The owner died. Now, Dred Scott is returned to slavery. However, the uh, Missouri Compromise from 1820, the law of the land, was that if a slave is taken to a free area, they become free. But Dred Scott was returned to slavery. For 11 years, he fought in courts to try to gain his freedom and was defeated. It went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1857, and the Supreme Court ruled that a black man has no rights that a white man must respect. And even if you're freed, you can be returned to slavery. That was the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Roger B. Tawney. The other case was Plessy versus Ferguson. This is 1896 in Louisiana. Louisiana, like other, like other southern states, and a town in the state of Alabama, which is the setting for this play, had segregation laws. Uh, blacks had to ride in one train car. Blacks had to later, you know, years later, sit in the back of the bus. Blacks couldn't use a water fountain, couldn't attend the same schools. Segregated laws. There was an African American named Homer Plessy. He was biracial. He was one eighth black, seven eighths white. If you and I saw him, he looks white. However, Louisiana and other states like Alabama, the state in this play, had laws that if you're one quarter black, one eighth black, one sixteenth black, all the way to one thirty second, you were labeled accordingly. So Homer Plessy in Louisiana in 1896 was one eighth black. He was therefore labeled an octoroon. Even if you're one thirty second, you're labeled one drop of the N word, blood, and you're considered black, one thirty second. So Plessy is getting on a train. He decides to sit in the white car, but he's arrested. They wouldn't have known he was black, but he was an agitator and an activist, so they recognized him. His case goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules separate but equal. So folks have to use segregated, separate facilities, but that was still seen as equal. Those are the kind of court cases that would be important precedents for the case that Atticus Finch tries in this play. America has made great progress. Uh, women constitute about half of those in medical school, law school, the far majority in veterinary schools of medicine. We have a quarter of the Congress is now female. There are African Americans in Congress. We had an African American president. We now have a female African American vice president descended from immigrants on both sides of the family. So we've made great progress in America, but it's not been easy. It has not been quick and has not been without bloodshed. So it's difficult, and the route still continues. This book, this play, this movie have stood the test of time. It's eternally relevant as it is today. Today in politics, we see the same kind of debates over affirmative action, over immigration, over refugees. And these debates speak to the kind of court case that Atticus Finch tries in this play. I've had the great fortune of reading a book uh, I've seen the movie a couple times, big Gregory Peck fan. Saw the play in New York City, loved it, loved the playwright Aaron Sorkin. And even though I've seen this so many times and I know how it ends, I'm always cheering for Atticus. I'm always crushed. It, it, my eyes water up. Uh, this play still resonates with me. It, 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 it remarkably finds a way of being so personal and so intimate, I think, for everybody in the audience. So I can't wait to join all of you at the Broward Center and see it yet again.